Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Uh, before we begin, please note that we're video recording and photographing this session. So if you'd prefer not to be videotaped or photographed, this has been a bad hair day, please tell our video technician and photographer, and we will think of ways of um, excising you. Um, <laughs> so uh, thanks very much. So welcome to Religions in the Practice of Peace Colloquium. I'm uh, David Hempton, the uh, uh, Dean of the Divinity School. So thank you all for joining us tonight um, uh, in these kind of winter evenings. And I'd like to begin by extending our, our thanks and a particularly warm welcome to our speaker, Professor Martin uh, Nowak, who has, yeah, so thank you for being here. <clears throat> who has actually spoken in this room um, uh, many times before, I think, or at least several times before. Once, maybe. Once. <laughs> Just felt like a lot. Um, and, um, and did collaborate uh, with uh, one of our colleagues, um, Sarah Coakley, um, in, a, in, in days gone by. So I've listened several times. At least several times, yeah. Listened. I've listened. Several oh, you've times. listened? Yeah. Yeah, well, that, that. so thank you so much for, um, for giving up an evening uh, to come and speak with us. Also very grateful to um, uh, tonight's moderator and discussant, um, Professor Janet uh, Giazzo, and to uh, Professor Armonius. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'd also like to express our gratitude to RPP's generous supporters, including uh, uh, Karen uh, Vickers Budney and Al Budney, for helping make these and other RPP activities possible, and to our, fa <coughs> and to our fabulous RPP student assistants and staff for their work in organizing this event. Please, let's give a hand to those uh, wonderful people. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Is it, it, it is our hope that these RPP colloquium sessions can be an opportunity um, not only to learn about peace practice, but also to practice peace together. So we plan to experiment a little with formats to support this, and we welcome your creative ideas for that as we go forward. The RPP team and I have been reflecting on this, and we've come up with a few introductory words to start us off this evening. So two of our graduate assistants, uh, Hope and Jonathan, will join me and we will have a little um, uh, triage of readings. So thank you so much. Um, so we are gathered to advance sustainable peace and to learn and grow in our peace practice. Let's begin by cultivating engaged, caring, and appreciative relationships here and in all our settings. Sustainable peace is a complex endeavor to which everyone has much to contribute. We'd like to share some aspirations which we hope um, you'll help us keep in view and hopefully will resonate with you. So hope. <laughs> As members of one human family, how can we relate to one another in a spirit of love and friendship despite our differences, disagreements, and limitations? How can we acknowledge contributions from all cultures and traditions as equally valuable and appreciate and benefit from everyone's experiences and wisdom? How can we attend to our biases and to oppressive systems of power based on race, ethnicity, religion, gender, sexual orientation, economic status, and other factors and empower one another to promote justice and shared flourishing? How can we work for equity and justice in ways that are humanizing, build connection, and promote healing and transformation? What wisdom, knowledge, and spiritual resources do we need to do these things? Please join us in creating a courageous, respectful, and forgiving space conducive to deep sharing, deep listening, and mutual learning. Let's practice sharing questions and comments, as well as concerns and differences of view, while maintaining a validating environment across these differences. We are interdependent, and we need one another to expand our vision and help us consider our blind spots. So let's seek deeper understanding when we see things differently, draw upon our spiritual resources, and support one another in constantly improving our approach to each other and to what we do. We acknowledge that conversation of this kind is challenging. Listening to other perspectives and sharing our own makes us vulnerable and can be uncomfortable. 
and it can be hard to process in the moment and to find words. At the same time, few things are more essential for our growth and collaboration towards sustainable peace. So we thank you all in advance. To give you an overview of tonight's session, we'll begin and end with a moment of silence. And after the introductions and Professor Nowak's presentation, we'll have brief responses from Professor Monius and Professor Gatso, and they'll engage Professor Nowak in some conversation. After that, we'll give everyone five minutes to discuss their thoughts with their neighbors. And finally, we'll invite your comments and ideas. If there are any ideas or concerns that you're not able to raise during the session, we hope you'll share them with us, either by dropping them in the basket right here that is placed on the front table at the end, uh, by telling us at the reception, or by emailing us at the address on the RPP website. So let's begin now with a moment of silent contemplation or prayer in gratitude, in remembrance of all lives who are suffering here and around the world, and to set our intentions for our practice of peace. Thank you, Hope and Jonathan, and to the RPP team, and thank you, everyone, for um, uh, 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 keeping that moment of silence. In the emerging One Harvard Sustainable Peace Initiative, uh, what we call the SPI, we're exploring ways to catalyze a global trend to mainstream sustainable peace as a goal of leadership across sectors and communities. We're very grateful to the many distinguished faculty from across Harvard schools and disciplines who have offered to lend their expertise to this initiative, including Professor Nowak, who has been a friend of the Divinity School for some time. Because fostering new levels of cooperation is central to efforts for sustainable peace, we've been very eager to learn from um, his many years of research and cooperation, which puts it in evolutionary perspective. Fortunately for us, he has also put a great deal of thought into the potential role of religion in universities, and we're delighted to put him in conversation with two of our distinguished scholars of religion this evening. So tonight's topic will be natural super cooperation and the future of our human family, evolutionary dynamics, altruistic virtues, and spiritual resources. So I'll briefly introduce our moderator, um, Professor uh, Janet Gyatso. Janet is the Hershey Professor of Buddhist Studies and Associate Dean for Faculty and Academic Affairs at the Divinity School. She's a specialist in Buddhist studies with concentration on Tibetan and South Asian cultural and, and intellectual history. Her books include um, Apparitions of the Self, The Secret Autobiographies of a Tibetan Visionary, In the Mirror of Memory, Reflections on Mindfulness and Remembrance in Indian and Tibetan Buddhism, Women of Tibet, and most recently, Being Human in a Buddhist World, an Intellectual History of Medicine in Early Modern Tibet. She's been writing on sex and gender in Buddhist monasticism and on the current female ordination movement in Buddhism. Previous topics of her scholarship have included visionary revelation in Buddhism, lineage, memory, and authorship, the philosophy of experience, and autobiographical writing in Tibet. Janet was also president of the International Association of Tibetan Studies um, and co-chair of the Buddhism section of the American Academy of Religion from 2004 to 10. She teaches um, lecture courses and seminars in Buddhist history, ritual and ideas, and on Tibetan literary practices and religious history. She's also involved in the development of a new track for the training of Buddhist lay ministers and leaders in the Master of Divinity program at the Divinity School, which has been really a very exciting venture in our program. She taught for uh, many years at Amherst before coming to Harvard uh, as Divinity School's first Hershey Professor of Buddhist Studies. And in July 2014, she became the Divinity School's Associate Dean for Faculty and Academic Affairs, which gives her the great pleasure of working with me every day. <laughs> so, uh, Janet, thanks very much. If you would um, come and introduce our other speakers, I'd be grateful. Thanks. Thank you so much for the introduction, and good evening, everyone. It's very nice to see you all here. 
And uh, yes, it is a great pleasure actually to work with David Hempton, who himself is a super cooperator. I can attest to that. And so um, the more the better. Uh, so uh, we're very excited to get on with the evening's topic. Let me just introduce to you briefly uh, our two other speakers. Uh, our main speaker, Pro uh, Professor Martin Nowak, we're really excited to hear from him. He's an absolutely leading figure today in unpacking the implications of Darwinism, evolutionary theory for ethics. So it's really great to have him here. He's one of these amazing intellectuals who uh, has <clears throat> extremely technical and detailed knowledge, but is able to uh, express it and write about it in accessible ways for a large audience, which is not, doesn't usually happen. And so it's great to have someone like that here so we can really talk things through. Uh, he's, he's currently professor of biology and mathematics at Harvard University. He's also director of the program for evolutionary dynamics. He works, he works on the mathematical description of evolutionary processes, including the evolution of cooperation and human language, as well as the dynamics of virus infections and human cancer. An Austrian by birth, um, Professor Nowak studied biochemistry and mathematics at the University of Vienna with Peter Schuster and Carl Sigmund. He got his PhD in 1989. He went on to the University of Oxford as an, as an Erwin Schrodinger scholar and worked there with Robert May, the later Lord May of Oxford, with whom he co-authored numerous articles and his first book, which was called Virus Dynamics in 2000. He was a junior research fellow at Wolfson College at Oxford and later at Keble College, and he was also a Wellcome Trust senior research fellow in London. He became head of the mathematical biology group at Oxford in 1995, professor of mathematical biology in 1997, and a year later, he moved to Princeton to establish the first program in theoretical biology at the Institute for Advanced Study. He accepted his present position at Harvard University in 2003, where he has stayed ever since, to our benefit. Uh, he's the author of over 400 uh, papers, four books, recipient of numerous prizes, and he's also a member of the Austrian Academy of Sciences. And you've already heard my introduction, and uh, <laughs> Professor Ann Monius, who will also be the other respondent and discussant tonight, is uh, our professor here at Harvard Divinity School. Uh, she's a historian of religion, and she specializes in the religious traditions of India. Her research interests lie in examining the practices and products of literary culture to reconstruct the history of religions in South Asia. Her first book was called Imagining a Place for Buddhism, Literary Culture and Religious Community in Tamil-Speaking South India, which examined the two extant Buddhist texts composed in Tamil. Her current research project is called Singing the Lives of Shiva's Saints, History, Aesthetics, and Religious Identity in Tamil-Speaking South India, in where she is considering the role of aesthetics and moral vision in the articulation of a distinctly Hindu religious identity in 12th century South India. Both of her works point to a larger focus on the ways in which aesthetics and ethics define religious identity and community in South Asia, as well as to the creative and productive encounters among sectarian religious communities. So uh, please welcome in, in uh, please join me in welcoming um, our speakers and we're first going to hear, I believe that's the next item, we're actually going to hear from Professor Nowak. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, it's a great um, honor for me to be here. And the short uh, title of my talk is actually um, God and Evolution. And um, as an evolutionary biologist, uh, I often uh, experience this as a dichotomy. You know, so this is um, people who would sort of hear that I'm interested in religious topics or belief in God, they would be very surprised and say, how can you do that as an evolutionary biologist? Um, and I find that in some sense unfortunate, but it's also there strongly in our society, in the US very much, in Europe also, that somehow people are presented as if there's a choice between sort of subscribing to Darwinian evolution and Christianity, for example. And you can, not both can be true. The two are basically contradictory. And that I think is unfortunate. 
And I think there's no reason for this. And um, in order to examine this possible dichotomy, I want to tell you about evolution and then about what, for example, my perspective of God would be. Um, it's not so unusual. It's very much grounded in, in, in Christian uh, philosophy and philosophy in general. So the first part of my talk will be about evolution and then about some um, philosophical religious ideas. I'm not only interested in somehow the tension between God and evolution in particular, but between God and science more generally. Because again, it is very much presented as if science is a replacement for religion. And I think that's actually unfortunate. So um, this is how I start uh, most of my uh, talks, uh, uh, my classes, I mean, uh, when I give my class uh, on evolutionary dynamics, uh, and the first slide that I show is the time scale. So these are the big events, the big events that one uh, should be interested in, and there are six big events, and of that magnitude, there are almost no others. You know, there's, it's very hard to think what else would you actually add to that list. So you could ask the question, when did it all begin? When did our universe come into existence? And then physicists here look at you and they tell you 13.7, billion years ago. They kind of know this for several reasons, but one simple reason how you can actually get this calculation is the galaxies move away from each other. So we know the distance of the galaxies, we know the speeds, so we can calculate when were they all in one point, and that's the kind of figure that you get. So that's uh, the time when the universe came into existence, 13.7 billion years. Then you ask the physicists, when did our solar system come into existence? And for example, Stein Jakobsen, who is here at Harvard, uh, looked at me and said 4.567 billion years ago. This is when the when sun was born. So physicists, they tend to know the answers quite precisely. How do you know such things? Because of radioisotopic de decay that you can monitor precisely and you know when the uh, sun uh, was ignited. You could also ask him a question was, for example, when was the last supernova that actually gave rise to the material that is in our a solar system, and that was only a few million years before the birth of the sun. You can also say when was Earth born, and Earth was born 25 million years, so very shortly after the sun was born, and the other planets came into existence, and so on. And now we want to come to the biological questions, and we would like to know, uh, for example, when was the origin of life? Most biologists believe there was an origin of life on Earth. It is sensible to assume this. You know, there would be other possibilities, but most biologists think origin of life happened on Earth. When was it? We don't actually know for sure. I mean, Earth is approximately as old as Sun. But the really clear evidence for bacterial life on Earth that is undisputed is 3.5 billion years ago. So some people want to push this earlier, and they have evidence for this, but it's disputed. Undisputed, every biologist accepts. By 3.5 billion years ago, it was a planet covered with bacteria. Bacteria were present at that time and they leave traces in the, in the rocks that are unambiguous uh, evidence of life on Earth. And then we had to wait 1.7 billion years for the next big thing to happen, and this is the emergence of higher cells. So bacteria are prokarya, archaea, they are simple cells. Simple cells don't have organelles. Uh, all the cells that make up our body, for example, all the human cells that make up our body are eukaryotic cells, so animals and plants are eukaryotic cells. They have a nucleus, they have a more complicated genetics, a more complicated architecture. Amazingly, it took 1.7 billion years for that actually to emerge. Um, and then, from that point on, it took another billion years to arrive at complex multicellularity. Complex multicellularity is actually, for the first time, something that you can see without a microscope. So a structure that is out there, uh, like, a, like an animal, like a plant, and that is only 600 million years old. And then, I think in the last 600 million years, the most interesting thing that evolution discovered was human language. And human language gave rise to a new mode of evolution, therefore, because before human language, evolution, evolution is always about information transfer, is restricted to genetics. But with human language, there's another kind of evolution, and that evolution is cultural evolution, where the information is transferred in, in, by the means of human language. So in some sense, humans have invented another way of evolutionary dynamics that is based on language. And for human ideas to spread in the population, 
we don't have to wait for genetic fixation, for genetic mutation to reach fixation, but rather the idea spreads. So it's a fast evolution that humans have invented. And that makes us very powerful. And this is for the better and for the worse. So this makes us successful, but also very dangerous. And we are a species that actually could more or less eliminate a test that has the power to eliminate itself uh, from, the pl from, from the planet and make the planet uninhabitable for intelligent life. And that's one of the biggest problems of our time. So how does it all begin? And the answer is nobody really knows. But there are many papers, many experiments, and many ideas somehow that explore this question of the origin of life. So the idea is there was a chemistry that was going on on early Earth, and that chemistry was sufficiently complicated and interesting, and that gave rise to, to something like uh, chemical uh, <coughs> compounds that I call monomers that can actually give rise to polymers. So this would be the building blocks of RNA and DNA, and that would be something like RNA and DNA, and I call this pre-life. So this construction of information without reproduction, I call pre-life. But once reproduction is here, that is life, and that's the origin of evolution. So the origin of evolution is actually the origin of production, reproduction. There are these RNA or DNA molecules, for example, that can make copies of itself. But before this, you have to postulate a chemistry that does its stuff without reproduction and nevertheless gives you something that then has the ability to reproduce. So there's something very strange that we have there in evolutionary theory. Once you have evolution, you think everything is being done for you. In order to get evolution, you have to be fortunate. You have to be lucky for something to happen that can then evolve. And I think this is another dichotomy that is unfortunate because I think it is not exactly like that. And I'm very much looking for a gradual transition from chemistry to biology. Um, so then after we have this origin of life, uh, Wally Gilbert and others have postulated this idea of an RNA world. So right now RNA is a very powerful molecule and a very powerful compound in every cell. And RNA has the ability to store information, to make copies, and also to catalyze reactions. So it has all the things that you need for life, and therefore the idea is that maybe in the beginning there was an RNA world. There are also other scientists who say, no, 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 that's completely impossible because RNA is such a fragile molecule. It couldn't have been there in the beginning without the help of proteins, and that's totally, that's also, that's correct. Um, so it is not so clear whether there was ever um, a world that was just an RNA world. Most likely all these things started kind of simultaneously and merged together, lipids, RNA, and proteins. Um, so these uh, lipids can spontaneously form protocells, and these protocells are vesicles, and then if these vesicles have RNA in them, you have sort of an idea of how you get the first cells. And Jack Shostak's group here at Harvard does, for example, experiments both with RNA replication and with protocells. And protocells can spontaneously form, and they can also divide under certain conditions. They have not yet been able to have also spontaneous RNA replication in there, and then the RNA replication driving the cell division. That's what you want eventually. But it's sort of heading in this direction that this might be possible. And after some time, RNA would recruit proteins. And so RNA can make a copy of itself, but it can also give rise to the production of proteins. That's protein biosynthesis. The proteins are then themselves helping this production. That's what is happening now in cells. And the proteins help also the RNA reproduce. And eventually, um, RNA is somehow replaced as a storing information uh, for a molecule by DNA. It's more stable. DNA has the genetic information. It gives rise to RNA. RNA gives rise to proteins. And that's called the central dogma of molecular biology. And that's the architecture that is there in every cell, bacterial cell, uh, human cell, animal cell. So this is how information is um, stored, transferred, used, and then used for function. However the origin of life was, um, after a certain amount of time, we end up with a world of bacteria. So by 3.5 billion years, it was a world of bacteria. And right now, if we look at our world, we can, also, we can ask the following question. How many cells are there on Earth? So, like, scientists like to ask questions like this, you know, how many protons are there in the universe? You know, that's an interesting question. Physicists can calculate this, 10 to the 80. How many cells are there on Earth? And how do you estimate this? The, the first thing that you have to realize, the only thing that you have to count 
is the number of bacteria, because everything else is pocket change. So if you want to know the number of cells, it's still just bacteria. And it's actually in the human body, there might be like 10 to the 14 human cells. There are also 10 to the 14 or more bacterial cells sitting around us, in us. So the answer is, on Earth, there are 10 to the 30 cells. That is 10 to the 30 bacterial cells. So 3.5 billion years ago, it was a planet just bacteria. And more or less, it hasn't changed that much. It's still mostly bacteria. There are a few other things that are also there. But they don't even count when you make the numbers, when you just count cell number. If you want to know biomass, then it is not just bacteria, because half of the biomass is bacteria, and half of the biomass is plants, and that's because of wood. But um, compared to that, animals, or especially humans, have a very small biomass. And here is um, a timetable that Andy Knoll, um, uh, here from the Harvard OEP department, drew for one of our joint papers, and this is what we call the timetable of evolution. And this is um, all the big events of evolution from the origin of life. So here you have a time scale that is 4.567 billion years ago, so that's the birth of, of Earth. Then you have the first period, and I love these names, the Hadean, the Archean, the Proterozoic, and the Phenerozoic. So these are the four epochs of life on Earth, and this is now the present. And down here, you just have blown up this last few this last bit of time, 635 million years. But um, there was the origin of life and the transition between the Hadean and the Archean. And here was then the evidence of the first carbon and sulfur cycles. And then oxygenic photosynthesis, I will come to this. Um, what I really want to draw your attention to are these, these two big letters here. That's the GOE and the NOE. That's called the Great Oxygenation Event. And that's the neo, neo proterozoic Oxygenation Event. Um, I will, uh, so here you have for the first time macroscopic animals. They are like 500 something million years ago only. All of this life before was microscopic. <coughs> Let's come to these oxygenation events. Um, here you have the oxygen level in the atmosphere of the planet. By 2.4 billion years ago, the oxygen level in the atmosphere increased approximately 10,000 fold. There was a 10,000-fold increase in oxygen. There was maybe a short decline and uncertainty here, and then there was another 10 to 100-fold increase in this neo, neo oxygenation event that happened about 800 million years ago. But now we have our oxygen level up here. So before, there was not free oxygen in the atmosphere. And now we have a lot of oxygen in the atmosphere. And so this first um, increase in oxygen, the great oxygenation event, what happened at that time? So what happened at this time was the following. Life had already been around for quite some time. Life, as I told you, was bacterial. What does life do? It's in the oceans. There are bacterial cells in the oceans. What do they have to do? Is to, They have to reproduce themselves. They have to produce organic material. How do they produce organic material? They have to take CO2 from the atmosphere. There was CO2 in the atmosphere. They get CO2 from the atmosphere in order to make sugar and other stuff that they need to build themselves. Um, for this reaction, they need energy. Typically, for most of the bacteria, the energy comes from the sun. This is photosynthesis. But in that chemical reaction, there is a partner for the electron uh, donor reaction that has, to, that has to be part of the reaction. And that partner before this event was iron. So there was iron in the oceans. This was the iron availability in the oceans. And there were bacteria that used the iron in the photosynthesis that they had in order to produce themselves, to produce sugar. And iron was very limited compared to, it was, there was some kind of a battle over this iron. And sometimes the iron would run out, and then they couldn't reproduce. So some bacteria came up with another invention. And that invention was an oxygenic photosynthesis, where they don't use iron, but water. They just use water. And water is always there. There's always enough water for them. But it's a very difficult chemical reaction to split water. And that's what they invented. And that was invented only once. And it was never, ever invented again by evolution. 
And this is the photosynthesis that we see around us that all plants are using. They have adopted this from the cyanobacteria. So this was invented by cyanobacteria. And so the theory here is that the cyanobacteria came about. They invented oxygenic photosynthesis. And the waste product of that chemical reaction is oxygen. So the oxygen is the waste of that. And so they produce the oxygen as a waste. What does the oxygen do? Once the oxygen goes up, the iron rusts. So the competitors then don't really have what they need to live. And the cyanobacteria take over and dominate the world. Then the oxygen is very high. And for the first time now, there's so much oxygen in the, in the atmosphere that another life form emerges. And this is to use oxygen to burn sugar to get energy. That's what we are doing. That's called aerobic reproduction. That happened exactly here. That was the birth of the eukaryotic cell. So the eukaryotic cell came only when the oxygen was actually high enough. There is something amazing because the cyanobacteria were there presumably many hundreds of millions of years ago prior to the GOE. So why did the GOE only happen here and not already before? So the theory that Andy Noll and I are actually proposing is that the timing is not because evolution has discovered oxygen photosynthesis here, evolution discovered it actually already here. There was a steady state with the oxygen in the atmosphere. The reason why the oxygen accumulated was because the planet changed. The planet started formation of continents. And formation of continents reduces the rate at which oxygen is removed from the atmosphere. So if that theory is actually correct, the big time scale of the evolutionary events is not so much caused by evolution. We are waiting for evolution instead. It is a physical change of what the planet itself is doing, namely to build continents, which allows, which reduces the rate at which oxygen is removed, and therefore oxygen accumulates. And same here, there's a breakup of the supercontinent, which is another way how the oxygen burying rate can be reduced. So we are actually very much dependent for understanding the overall time scale on, on the planet. And um, this is an image of the sun. And relatively, the size, these are the planets, the other planets of our solar system. And one of these small uh, spheres here is Earth. Um, that's Jupiter. Um, so most of the mass in our solar system is in the sun. And physicists understand very well that sun stars make chemistry. Chemical reactions, chemical um, elements are produced by nuclear synthesis in the stars and in other processes. But the idea here is, and some planets make biology. So the place in the universe where biology, where life can originate, is most likely, as much as we understand now, only by planets, and only planets if they do certain things. So for example, if Earth would never have formed continents, maybe we would still be just a world of bacteria. In any case, um, we have this tree of life. Um, and in this tree of life, there are these three big domains, bacteria, archaea, eukarya, and animals. So up here are animals. And there's another huge tree of animals. And sort of we are part of that animal tree there. And then we are asked to, to believe that evolution gives rise to all of this. So we have to ask, what is evolution? What is actually evolution? And, um, Ernst Meyer, who was a Harvard professor, who I think who lived to be 106 years of age, he, he wrote a very beautiful book uh, that is called What, uh, what Evolution Is. Um, and in that book, he asks the question, what is evolution? But what is it that evolves? And he says, loosely speaking, we talk about evolution of species. That was his field. Evolution of genes, evolution of the brain. We, we say all those sentences. But that's only figuratively speaking. The only thing that actually evolves are populations. Populations of reproducing individuals, cells, plants, animals. So the carrier of the evolutionary process is a population. And a population consists of individuals, and the individuals reproduce. And in our modern analysis, these individuals could reproduce genetically or culturally in some sense. So you could have students that sort of adopt your ideas. So there's a genetic reproduction, there's a cultural reproduction. And then there's mutation. And mutation is now a new thing comes about. For example, a genetic mutation or a new idea. 
And then there's selection. And selection means that there's different growth rates for different types. After some time, maybe red, because it reproduces faster, is more abundant than blue. And we call this selection. So the ingredients of evolution are unbelievably simple. It's populations of reproducing individuals, mutation, and selection. And to these two fundamental principles, mutation selection, in the last um, 20 years, I have sort of proposed to add cooperation as a fundamental principle in evolution. And cooperation is the idea that cells or individuals not only fight against each other, they also help one another and typically to give rise to higher structures. So you can think of cooperation, for example, giving rise to the first multicellular organisms or the origin of the cell. So cooperation, um, in a simple view, is the following interaction. There's a donor and there's a recipient. The donor pays a cost, the recipient gets a benefit. So this could be an interaction between humans, but it could be an interaction between cells. For example, there are two cells, and one cell produces a substance which is beneficial for other cells, and so that has a cost, and the other cells have a benefit. Or it can be animals, ants. So cooperation is the idea that in a competitive process, we help one another. And if you think of Darwinian evolution and just competition, you know, that shouldn't be. That shouldn't actually be easy, you know, because we are actually competing with each other. It's about natural selection. So there should not be room to help one another. Darwin actually wrote, if you can show me an animal that has a trait that is only there to help another one, then that would be an argument against my theory. Um, so if you have this idea of cooperation, the first thing that we can say and that we have to admit is that natural selection opposes cooperation. Natural selection is that competition, and that competition doesn't like cooperation because it is, that's not smart, right? So if you have a population of cooperators and defectors, that defector always has more, has a higher payoff than those cooperators because the defector receives help but doesn't give any help. It's a free rider. So if that payoff is higher, if that is more fit, you know, it's more, more success, after some time it will reproduce faster than the others, and then natural selection will have wiped out all cooperators and has ended up with a situation where they're only defectors. So normally we think of natural selection as a force that gives a desired outcome. But here's a counterexample. So natural selection leads to something bad, because here it was actually better still apart from this individual uh, then here where everybody is a defector. So natural selection is not only leading to the desirable outcome. Natural selection opposes cooperation, and therefore natural selection needs help to favor cooperators over defectors. And this help that natural selection needs, um, I summarize in terms of mechanisms for the evolution of cooperation. And there are many thousands of papers that are written on the question, how can we get evolution to favor cooperation and I propose to summarize those approaches into these five mechanisms that's also described in my book with Roger Highfield super cooperators. And these mechanisms are direct reciprocity, indirect reciprocity, spatial selection, group selection, kin selection. And just to give you some idea, direct reciprocity is um, we have a repeated interaction and we help each other because today I help you, tomorrow you will help me. It's a repeated interaction between the same people. Indirect reciprocity is based on reputation. You help somebody, and others see this, and they think, she's a very helpful individual. We also should help her. That's, these two are the most important mechanisms, actually, for humans, um, because most of our interactions occur in settings of repetition and reputation. Spatial selection is the idea that you can form clusters or friends you know, of cooperators, the friendship, and they can then prevail in a world of defectors. Group selection is that groups of cooperators outperform groups of defectors. And kin selection is the idea that you help genetic relatives. And here are three examples of cooperation. Um, as it existed already 3.5 billion years ago, so these are cyanobacteria that form filaments, and every so often a cell dies in order to feed the others with nitrogen. So the cell here gives its life to have the other cells reproduce. And this is as old as the evidence of life on Earth. And then here we have something um, that was very much studied by Ed Wilson, who also gave a talk here in that room, 
uh, in 2004 or 5. 125 million years ago, there was the um, emergence of new social insects. And here we have workers that do not reproduce themselves, but they help another individual reproduce. So the question is, again, in evolutionary theory, how can it be that you get an individual that only helps another individual to reproduce? And that's called new sociality. And these mechanisms for evolution of cooperation can explain that. And here, of course, in our own time period, uh, this is a painting of Vincent van Gogh of the Good Samaritan. So humans help one another. And in many cases, this comes very natural. So cooperation is needed for construction. That's what I find so interesting. When we ask, our, when we ask ourselves, how do we make these steps in evolution that lead just from the very beginning to complex multicellularity, to insect societies, to people, in all of those steps, it seems that cooperation is actually needed and selection alone does not do it. Cooperation is kind of the master architect of biological complexity. So the message of this part of my talk was really that evolution is not only competition. Evolution is also cooperation. Evolution to a very, very large extent is also that of helping one another. And that is a much more positive message of Darwinian evolution. It is not just fighting. So as, as you're all sitting here, we all here, we are connected back. It's an unbroken line to the origin of life of individuals, you know, then there's a long stream of humans and then previous ancestors and so on. It's an unbroken line that connects each of us to the origin of life. And so in the classical Darwinian setting, that's an unbroken line of winners. They won just the struggle, the fight, you know, they were the ruthless ones. But in the new perspective, it's also an unbroken line of helpers. They were the ones who helped and who received help. I think that's an interesting uh, modification of the, of the view. And also, when we do the mathematical analysis, uh, in many cases, what we find is that winning strategies of cooperation are hopeful, generous, and forgiving. So what we do is a calculation, and in that calculation we ask, who wins in the end? Who, has, who is favored by natural selection? Who has the highest payoff? And what we find is, in order to do that, very often you have to have these properties. And what do these properties mean? If I start an interaction with a new individual, I'm hopeful that I can cooperate with that individual. So my first move is cooperation. Typically, winning strategies have to start with cooperation. The other aspect, which is very important, is generosity in the following sense. Um, if we have an interaction that gives you something and gives me something, I do not count, you know, who gets more. I, I'm very happy that you have, say, 51%, I have 49%. Um, I'm, I'm not destroying the relationship for losing just a little bit. Because overall, the competition is between lots of people, not just bear bugs. This is where humans often make a mistake, that they think um, in order to succeed, they have to win against one particular other person, you know, like in, in tennis or something like this. But typically, interactions are not like that. And winners in that context are often strategies that lose every single pairwise encounter, but accumulate a lot of payoff anyway. <laughs> so that's generosity. You don't even insist for 50%. Slightly less than 50% is also good enough in a pairwise encounter. And forgiving is very important. So if the opponent does not cooperate with you, defects, we call it defects, you have to find a way to forgive. Because if you're a strict retaliator in the form of tit for death, you will never forgive and you will never come back to cooperation. So winning strategies have to have a way to forgive, which means to re-establish cooperation after a defection. And now I come to the second part of my talk where I would like to ask what is the relationship between evolution or science more generally and God. And um, in some sense, the questions here are, uh, does science suggest there is no God? Does science prove that God does not exist? Does science make God obsolete? And with many of my uh, scientific colleagues, if I would 
discuss such questions with them, they would actually answer yes to all three of them in some sense. And I'm actually very surprised um, because my next question would then be, what is God? If you are so absolutely sure, you know, that science rejects, science does that for you, you know, I have to ask you, what do you think is actually God? And here, I'm very surprised that most of my scientific colleagues, in some sense, have never thought of that question. I mean, either they have never thought of that question, or only to the extent, in the same sense, that they don't believe in Santa Claus. So it, in the same way as science tells you there's no Santa Claus, they, so what exactly do you mean by God, if you are so sure that science rejects God? But that is also the question for everybody. So if you want to have the view that science does not reject God, what is God? That's the question that we have to ask ourselves. And of course, uh, many people have, been, have written about that uh, for millennia. You know? and so here's a quote. A faithless ocean of being from whom all things originate. Beside him, there is no second. Beyond him, there is no other. Moses Maimonides. Mm -hmm. very much influenced um, by Aristotle, and then later, in turn, influenced Thomas Aquinas, of course. So an ocean of being from him, from whom things originate. And I find this also, in some sense, if you think about God, then there's no other principle that is on the side of this. You know, it's, a, it's a unique principle. It's not that there are three or four or five equal principles, if you think about that version of God. And also, if you think about God, you have reached the foundation. There's nothing below it. There's nothing that gives rise to God. So beyond him, there is no other. So this is my worldview. And this is the worldview that I think that comes very reasonably out of the activity of being a scientist, and especially being a scientist who uses mathematics to understand the world. So there are many types of scientists. I'm one who tries to understand principles in the world and then describe this principle with, with mathematical equations. So for me, there's the obvious um, sensation, I would call it, that underneath this world of change that we are seeing and that we have discussed here, this 13.8 billion years, there is an unchanging reality. And what is this unchanging reality? That's, for example, the world of mathematics, or natural laws, fundamental principles. So like the equations of Newton, also the, the laws of Newton, um, they are not dependent they don't change over time, you know, they are unchanging. They are part of this unchanging reality. When a mathematician proves a theorem, no experiment is needed to check it. So most mathematicians do not have the feeling that they make up things, they discover things. Mathematics discovers things. It discovers aspects of this underlying reality. So this, of course, is very close um, to the uh, idea of Plato of a logos, a fundamental truth. And that, I think, is a very natural view of a scientist, especially one who wants to understand laws of nature. So mathematics studies this unchanging reality, and science studies the instantiated world. And the amazing thing for me is that the language of science is mathematical. And that's kind of a mystery. Mathematics is an amazingly efficient language to describe scientific problems. So then I would continue to propose that God is a principle that causes existence. The unmoved mover, the primary cause, the highest form, the form of the good that illuminates all other forms. I think this is just Greek philosophy. So these are conclusions um, that are uh, that came to Plato and Aristotle, not necessarily from any particular religious um, perspective, and were later then uh, discovered as being completely fundamental to our Christian perspective, but also uh, Muslim perspective um, and Jewish perspective. So for the scientist who wants to use science to disprove God, you know, also note what we are talking about. God is not an object within the universe, is not caught in the flow of time, creates the world ex nihilo, is creator and sustainer, is that without which there would be nothing at all. 
And so these are not modern views at all. Uh, God is not an object in the universe, is not caught in the flow of time, creates the world ex nihilo is something you can find in the writings of St. Augustine. So God is described as existence itself. The existence of all other things depend on God. And the Platonic forms are ideas in the mind of God. So the fusion of Platonic philosophy and early Christianity gave a home to the Platonic ideas. Because the question for the Platonic ideas was always, where do they exist? And so the Christian philosophers would have answered, they are ideas in the mind of God. And if we think again, this idea that God creates ex nihilo in perpetuity and God holds every moment into existence, we also have to understand that the action of God is not in competition with any scientific process. So if you really think about this, you realize we are not saying something that could possibly be in competition with any scientific explanation. Uh, so evolution and other scientific processes emanate from God. It's very interesting when, when Darwin uh, had when Darwin had equation of gravity, he was actually briefly thinking, by having now a mathematical description of gravity, do I take away from the action of God? And then he made the remark, hypothesis non fingo, even though I have a mathematical description of gravity, I don't actually know why there is gravity. This could as well be the action of God. I make no hypothesis as to the nature um, of gravity. So I think this is a kind of view of God that is fully compatible with, with every activity of science and with the activity of being a scientist that no scientist could actually reject. And then the interesting thing is, in my discussions, it seems that most scientists, uh, most mathematical scientists would actually subscribe to some form of Platonism. But others would want to say there is no fundamental truth. And those that reject fundamental truth in every form, those that reject Platonism in absolutely every form, that leads basically to the question, what is then the activity of doing a scientist? So if nothing has any meaning, uh, why are you a scientist? What do you think is actually the activity of doing science? So I end my talk with just um, two quotes that I find very beautiful. In thee abide, fixed forever, the first causes of all things unabiding, and of all things changeable, the springs abide in thee unchangeable, and in thee live the eternal reasons of all things unreasoning and temporal. And the same person also wrote in the same book, thou awakest us to delight in thy praise, for thou madest us for thyself, and our heart is restless until it repos in thee. Thank you. Well, thank you. That was a pretty amazing talk. <laughs> First of all, we started out with the Big Bang. <laughs> yeah. And now we got to some really, we, we pretty much learned everything that one needs to know about anything, like the entire <laughs> <laughs> history of everything from the material perspective and the godly perspective. Uh, so, okay, so now Professor <laughs> Ann Monius and myself will attempt to say something intelligent. <laughs> Uh, and I, I will turn to my colleague, uh, Professor Monius, first, so that'll just give me a little more time to think. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We just had a little spat here down in the front row about who was going to go first, and she outranks me, uh, so I'm going first. I'm the first. moderator, so I choose. Yeah, she outranks me. Um, anyway, thank you, Professor Nowak, very much. That was, um, I haven't taken a class on evolutionary biology since I was in college 35 years ago. And that was a fantastic overview of the sort of, I, that was really a tour de force. So thank you very much and utterly accessible. Um, 
I want to ask you, this is, these are just brief comments and mm -hmm. will be. Um, I had a, uh, my, my largest question to ask you in terms of thinking about scientific explanations of evolution um, in relationship to religions, and as I warned you, neither one of us works on Christianity mm -hmm. in particular. Um, one of the biggest questions that I have for you in general, we can come back to it in the conversational, has to do with evolution, not um, as a theory of time, um, and a time of, in some sense, um, development, um, which strikes me as being a very Judeo-Christian view of time, very biblical view of time. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about how feasible it is to think about mapping uh, as easily as you have in this last uh, half of your talk, mapping um, a theory of evolution onto, say, the religions of South Asia, where time tends definitively toward devolution. Toward, I was thinking as you were going through, and I read your book over the weekend as well, the five mechanisms of super cooperation. And those are particularly highlighted, for example, in South Asian texts as what falls apart. And so thinking about ethics, since we're here in the Religion and Practices of the Peace Colloquium, the, ch the thinking about ethics in South Asia, and I would argue across religious traditions, begins with this temporal time of decay, not progress or positive evolution, but an, ins an insistence that things are going to get much, much worse before they get better, and we will not see them get to, it gets billions of years in the future, that things will return. And so the starting of all ethical thinking is how do you be human, humane? Uh, how do you flourish in a temporal circumstance that puts real limits on possibility, and particularly limits on cooperation? So while I can see that um, uh, the sort of Christian sort of view that you have of this God. It, it also raises the question, I think, about the God that you describe is largely outside the world of ethics. He's above the fray of the world that's created. And here in this particular colloquium, we're deeply concerned with fundamentally ethical questions in the context of religion. So I wonder, that, those would be the first questions, since Janet made me go first, that <laughs> leaped to mind immediately as a South Asianist who knows very little about Christian anything. I mean, the... Oh, wait. <laughs> <laughs> She's thought of something. <laughs> Hold on. So you're out of order. Um, <laughs> and we have to go by the order. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so now I'm going to give some questions, and then we, we can talk. Very detailed plan. Of and uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, so I have a, a few different kinds of questions. One is uh, very pragmatic. I don't entirely understand the fundamental role of cooperation when it is in fact the case that cooperation isn't always what wins the day. In fact, often it's the, so what is the metaphysics of cooperation? And, and actually that might be one of the most important questions of how do you connect the first part of your talk and the second part of your talk? So what does God have to do with all of this? But in any event, it's, and it, it, it also relates to Professor Monius's question, which is another view of the world, is that it's not getting better, it's getting worse. And we certainly are in a time, you can say, in which competition does seem to be winning the day. Of course, cooperation is important to a certain degree, but we know of certain people in the public domain who don't necessarily, are not necessarily loyal to their, uh, the people who have helped them and, um, and so on. Uh, you could also ask the question of the, those um, parts of evolution which sacrifice themselves for other, if in fact natural selection is the dominant um, uh, motivating uh, force, if the, the guys who are the most generous are the guys who die, they don't get to reproduce themselves, how does that work for natural selection? Okay, so those are just two very particular questions. Um, more fundamental question. Um, if, from what I got from reading your book, if it's the case that cooperation and the super cooperators 
is really based on the principle that cooperation helps us, that actually um, we will evolve, we will survive better if we cooperate. Mm -hmm. Uh, how do you deal with the problem of reductionism? In other words, if ethical principles are based on what ultimately is going to help me and further my own um, progeny and my own projects and so on, um, how does that, there's, there's the worry or the, pr the problem that actually every, all my cooperating is done really for the purpose of helping myself. This is a kind of thing that comes up in religious studies and ethics a lot, is that might it, there, there's kinds of ethical and, and let's say cooperative or generous responses which are not in my self-interest that might be a function of other uh, forces which are just as basic and fundamental as evolution per se. For example, the, the way in which one feels compassion for another, one feels sorry for another, when it's, it truly isn't in your self-interest at all. But there's some sort of identity, some sort of recognition, some sort of, as you said, natural impulse. How does that fit into, is that necessarily, does, 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 does that all really boil down to cooperation for the benefit of ultimately evolution and natural selection, or do we need to complexify? the picture. My third question, which may be getting us too far afield, but I do want to ask a little bit about something of the narrative that I detect in the book has, there's a kind of human triumphalism and human language that, um, which really, as you said, it actually has problems, but nonetheless, um, uh, in, in terms of what we're doing with the planet and so on. but. Um, um, what evidence do we have that, you know, what, what, what basically is your argument that humans are necessarily better cooperators than animals? Um, we certainly know that animals do cooperate, and as we're also finding out, animals' um, systems of communication and even forms of what we might call language, the uh, science in the last 20 years and so on has been discovering more and more and more of that. Is there necessarily something about humans that makes them better cooperators? Um, I'll, I'll close with one example. Um, I just happened to be watching a video because I'm an animal person, as all the students here know. And, um, <laughs> and most of the faculty. Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> and I just happened to be watching a video uh, this morning, something I've seen before. This is a really striking video. So there's like a bird some kind of blackbird that's fallen into a river. I don't know if you've seen this. And, and it's a small river and it's floundering. It can't swim. It's really about to drown. And there's a bear, a brown bear is walking by. You can see this whole thing on the video. Nobody set this up. And the brown bear sees this bird flapping and he looks down and is looking at the bird for a while. And then ultimately, finally, like, you know, grabs the bird by the wing and like pulls the bird out of the water and like just leaves him on the side of the thing and, and doesn't do anything, just walks away. And a, little, and a little later you see the bird like, okay, I'm still alive, and then, it, then, and then he flies away. Where's that coming out of? Is, is, there, is there an evolutionary um, benefit for the bear in doing that? Okay. <laughs> 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 Our part is done. <laughs> so I, I answered the questions in turn because I took notes. And I hope that. So the first thing is that um, it's completely true. It's actually, it's an, I think it's an amazing uh, remark that when we sort of line up our evolutionary achievements here, it's this kind of story of progress. Mm. And that is clearly the case. And... Um, in many, by many measures, you could say there's a progress. So that is the, what we have achieved here now is the product of evolution, and this was not there before, and the dinosaurs didn't mm -hmm. build cities, or, so it's progress. And that is true, and that is undeniably there, and we don't know how it will continue. You know, we don't know what will happen next. I mean, the, mm, what I mentioned briefly is I think intelligent life is inherently unstable, 
um, because it's so powerful. And that it could very well be that um, either with like a war-like disaster or just by destroying the environment, we make life impossible for humans. Um, and unless we solve co cooperation, global cooperation, and cooperation with future generations, that's also a topic that we, we ask. We, often we have like mechanisms for how you cooperate among friends and among people you know, but how do you cooperate with people who come after you, with future generations? Why would you hold back now such that they can enjoy a habitable planet? Um, so we don't know what will be the continuation of the evolutionary story. So far, it is an upward. Uh, if we look at the bigger picture, physicists somehow, they know how the downward will actually look like. Because, for example, physicists know that star formation has peaked in our universe by now. And fewer stars will be born in the future than have been born already. And there will be a time when no new star will come about anymore. And it seems that planet formation is somehow rising and maybe peaking right now, but there will also be a time when there's no new star, no new planet. So there is a kind of long-term perspective where nobody can think of anything, sort of being there, just black holes, and the black holes evaporate with the Hawking radiation in the end of the 60 years, which is very long. Um, but things kind of go away. So there is this in, in mm -hmm. physics where we can make a projection. Mm -hmm. So then the other questions. Um, mm, yeah, how can cooperation be fundamental if... So, I, so cooperation is something which is needed, for example, in order to build a cell. You have to have cooperation between the membrane and the things inside the cell and the different reproducing entities and whenever, or uh, social insects or multicellular organisms. So cooperation is a fundamental architect. And yet it is true that cooperation is never fully stable. So in all of our calculations, cooperation is produced for some amount of time, it's there to some extent, it's always exploited, and it could be destroyed again. So there's always the tension between cooperation and defection, and we never have this utopia of a fully stable, invulnerable, cooperative equilibrium. Why not? Um, because the mathematics doesn't allow it. The mathematics doesn't allow it. The mathematics doesn't allow it? <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what else? Let's I mean, put that up on the board. <laughs> <laughs> Can you give me the equation? What do you, what do you mean the mathematics doesn't allow it? Full cooperation is never stable, so you can show it's, it's never stable. stable. It can, How, always can you show that mathematically? Yeah. Can you? A Ben Allen could do this easily. Hi. <laughs> 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 stable in terms of the Nash equilibrium or something like that. It's, it's, it's what? It has, it has a kind of equilibrium concept that you have to like Nash equilibrium or these sort of things. And equilibrium, yeah. Yes, an equilibrium concept. So like a stable equilibrium. And we can show in many of those calculations, complete cooperation can always be exploited. There's always a way to kind of get around it. So that was the main theme of my work in the last 20 years that you always, you get cooperation for some time, then it gets destroyed and you have to rebuild it. There are always cycles. Okay, so then, but if cooperation were evolutionarily an advantage. It's always there. It's kind of always there as a possibility. It leads to complexity, but it is not the case that we will build a society where everybody cooperates with everybody else and that's the end of it. Okay, all right, well, we, I think we have to accept that. Right. <laughs> but then the, the yeah, the bear comes also the yeah. So the, the, the second point also hugely important, uh, and it has been raised often um, yes. whenever I talk to people who are from the divinity school. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Reductionism, right? Okay. Yeah. yeah the, so the, it is completely true that uh, our cooperators, you know, our help, hopeful, generous kind of strategies there. In the end if they're successful, they kind of win. So if, if I say a win winning strategies are hopeful, generous, and forgiving. So in the end, you could say, well, I'm generous because I know I'm winning. I'm forgiving because I know this helps me. How does it help you? Uh, to, to, that I, I win in this game, in this analysis. I get more points. I'm the, I'm the winning strategy in this. Stability and so on, long every, whatever. But uh, It's mathematical. There is, <laughs> the problem is, that's unsatisfactory because what, we, what you really want is altruism. You know? So now I'm yes. no longer using the word altruism because Sarah Coakley and others here in this room told me I should not use it actually long ago. And so, and then, yeah, in, in, in my work, in my own work, because then we said altruism, typically by philosophers and theologians, 
is understood as an action that is motivated by love. An action motivated by love. And I, in my analysis, have a hard time to really get to the motive. So I can talk about actions. I can analyze actions. I can sort of calculate this action and that action and what wins, what's the better strategy. But I'm not, I'm, I, I don't really know how to analyze the motive that is behind the action. So we have only very few insights into motive behind action. That's missing from this kind of analysis. That would be very nice to have. Well, yeah, you don't talk about, you don't have to talk about motive because you're just, as you say, you're just talking about what the most successful. Yeah, in some sense. So we, we and so the is, motive is a secondary epiphenomenon of psychology of somebody thinking it is something. Some, yeah, in some sense. So motive is complicated and it, uh, it's not so clear how to use this approach actually to study the motivation that is behind an action. She's talking about personality. Human sure, but we have done some attempts in this direction, um, and that would uh, that was, for example, a friend asks you whether you would help him sort of to move, and then your first question is, so how much stuff do you have, or something like this. You know? <laughs> <laughs> And then uh, that's reasonable to do, you know, but even more impressive would be, yes, I'm willing to help you, it's more impressive than that. So we call this a calculating cooperator and somehow somebody who cooperates without looking at the details. We, would be, we wish our friends sort of are of that second kind. So that would be one way to get that motive, but it's not so easy. Right, well, I guess, you know, if the model that you're suggesting is, is, some, is a way for us to think about our future, we, as practitioners who are actually trying to develop our generosity or our altruism or our cooperation, one needs uh, ways of cultivating that. And the way that you would cultivate it would be to find what it is within yourself that makes you do it. So that's why, in a certain sense, either motivation or, or sentiment or, 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 or proclivity or, or reason or something would be important to articulate because if we're trying to become better cooperators, we need to know how to do that. How do I find my cooperativeness within myself? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where is it? And that, that again, to bring this, to bring your talk back to the overall arc of this colloquium, is to think about at the end of your book on super cooperation, you seem to suggest that there's almost a possibility of educating people to mm. be better cooperators. And I'm wondering, yeah. for the purposes of this colloquium, where, OK, it's being filmed, but we're not publishing anything necessarily, would you be willing to go out on a limb and speculate a little bit more about what would that actually look like? What should, for the students and faculty here in the room, what should the lessons of your presentation on evolution and cooperation be? I think it is in this game theoretic mathematical analysis where it is just a question of how to win in certain game-like situations. The observation is that winning strategies have these very positive attributes. I think that's, for me, that's the starting point for a scientific examination of the question. Mm -hmm. So even in a very competitive setting, it is actually the case that we have to forgive. I find that very interesting. And then we start with this, and afterwards we ask the deeper uh, moral question or so, and what exactly is forgiveness, or what is the exact attitude. Mm -hmm. But I think that could be the starting point of something. But it shouldn't be the end. I think beyond this, we want actually to understand the motive. And in order to get the motive right, I think this is where I would point to the second part of my talk, because I think that gives you the motive. God. The practice of philosophy, for example. So what Socrates does for me is the same thing. OK. So that's good. Very interesting. Now the, we bear, the bear, the bear. Oh, the, oh yes, the bear, yes. The bear, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's not forget about the bear. <laughs> what about that bear on YouTube? <laughs> so yeah, the, why did the bear do that? Uh, the, the, I mean, the, there's, there's this randomness. I mean, I could. But, what? Random? Uh, yeah, but, so, but, but for, first of all, um, I think humans, let's take humans. You know, for example, you walk in the street, some person in front of you falls. 
you immediately want to help somebody. You could say that doesn't make any sense, you don't know that person, <laughs> if, absolutely nothing to, right. if anything is a competitor, but we have this instinct very strongly in us, oh, we want to help. Yes, that's right. Um, yeah. In my class, I often tell the story of the man who was in the New York subway um, in the morning with his daughters, bringing them to school, and in front of him, somebody had an epileptic seizure and fell on the tracks. And then the person at the headline of the train was coming to the station, and the person saw the situation and reacted, jumped down in order to pull the other one up, realized it was too late, pushed him down, pulled himself over it, and the train passed over both of them unharmed, and he saved. And that's a hero, you know, and very few of us would be so heroic. But all of us who would stand there would be deeply agitated, oh my God, what is happening here? How could I help this person? And you could say, for no reason whatsoever, you know. And the reason is, because we have these instincts and behaviors that could be selected in a context of family or group selection. So we live together with others, and if we help others in our group, group selection, that's a mechanism, that is favored. You help your children. And so we, the bear would be able to pull out the baby bear if it has fallen in here. So that's the kind of behavior that is there. And now suddenly this behavior is applied now in a slightly different context. <laughs> I would explain it like that. OK. All right, that's great. Thank you. Uh, instead of us continuing to pursue these, I think let's move to the next stage, which, and we're just exactly on time, is that the audience will now briefly converse with your neighbors. So you now have to cooperate and um, <laughs> talk with each other for about five minutes, and then uh, there will be uh, questions, and uh, you in the audience can raise questions and answers. So talk amongst yourselves. So the floor is open for questions and comments from the audience. Yes, ma'am. Um, so coming from the chemical biology side, I agreed with a lot of your presentation, but I do have a question that I've been thinking about myself. Um, and it's kind of whether the definition of God, as you're saying it, not as like a, you know, a benevolent like being or anything, just um, I see there's like a dichotomy and kind of a disparity between, uh, say, truth is in the numbers, where you can quantify things, you can calculate supernova collapse, or you can look at an equilibrium and see that an equilibrium is a net and that it always will be flu in fluctuation. But then also, on the other side of it, I was thinking when you were discussing the origins of life and how um, evolutionary biologists have that theory about, is it more like clay or like when the lightning struck a bunch of inorganic molecules to form the first organic compounds. So would you define God as that fate or would it be the logical uh, numerical values that you were discussing before? <laughs> So it's closer to the, to the second. So I would see God as the principle that is underlying everything. So it's not only creator, but also creator and sustainer. It's a perpetual creation. So it's not somebody who set initial conditions and then it just evolves by itself. So God is innermost existence in everything that exists. It's needed to uphold every moment into existence. It's the fundamental cause for everything that exists. So okay. it could be... It, it is very interesting to think how that acts in terms of making random choices. Thanks. So I have a question about um, religion and evolution specifically. Um, have you ever done any studies or read any research on the impact, the positive or negative impact of the people believing in God on a population? Like has that improved oh, their success in survival, especially in harsh or stressful conditions, environments? It's given them hope or faith and, and led to them to, to uh, endure? I mean, I, I have not done this, but I'm, I'm sure this has been done by people. And I think there was a conference recently here sort of about the beneficial um, effects of religious tendencies. I, w I would strongly believe that there's something very positive that comes out of, of proper religious activity. But the belief in God, specifically? Proper religious activities? I said proper religious activities, yes. Um, 
This is a divinity school. What do, what do you mean yeah. by that? <laughs> They're not going to let you get away with that. <laughs> what do you mean by proper? <laughs> mm. So like the first thing that I always hear when I talk to scientific colleagues who want to fight against any notion of God is that they say religion is bad. You know, religion leads to war. You know, religion leads to fundamentalism. And so then I would say that religion is powerful. You know, religion has been used by powerful people to, to create power and to has been abused. So that's what I would call an improper use of religious activity. And that I think one has to exclude that from the discussion. I mean, that's something else for me. I think a, a real understanding of truth is, um, is a commitment to love and to peace. Very much in the sense of, of, of what the Greek philosophers, philosophy is a practice that leads to a particular kind of life. I think that, that's for me exactly the same. That's what I would call a proper religious activity. Okay, that's a definition. Yes, sir, over there. Yeah. I would like to ask you to apply your, your, your thinking in, in any way you like to, to a particular problem. And, and that is those of us who believe in climate change who are nonetheless sleepwalking into it. So I'm, I'm, I'm not referring to deniers here. I'm referring to most of the people in this room who very much believe in it, but are not really doing anything to change what could be the fate of humankind, which is, so let me just let you take it from there. Yeah, I think this is a problem. Uh, mankind is confronted with a problem, uh, climate change, for which we have very few mechanisms for the solution of it, because it is like global. It requires global cooperation and it requires cooperation with future generations. So this for me is the fundamental issue that needs to be solved. So for me, the solution is not a technical solution, but a behavioral solution. And what we know about cooperation, our limited abilities to cooperate now has to change to involve a global cooperation and also a global cooperation that is really looking forward into the future. And that has to be achieved. And I think that's what the problem is. And so then many people believe in climate change, they kind of accept the scientific evidence, but they feel, well, what should I do about it? And, um, and that's exactly the issue, because it is, it is this, you are drowned with, this, with the demand that, you, that it, it has to be a global response, and it has to be a forward-looking global response. That's what we have to build. And it, we could well say that's one of our most important objectives in the next few years, to actually get that. Okay, in the back, yes. Thanks. Um, I agree with a couple, with you and, and the gentleman in front of me. I think that um, I call it um, climate disruption. It isn't just climate disruption, it's really eco collapse is going to be mankind's greatest crucible. But be that as it may, um, I, I do want to go back to the, the uh, issue you were talking about before the questions began about why do we do altruistic things? And I just, I can't help but think it's something to do with feeling. It's in our biology. And if you, and I would encourage everyone to, if you haven't heard of this, look at the research by Dr. Uh, Stephen Porges, P-O-R-G-E-S, on the polyvagal system. And how do we feel better? How do, what is really our well-being really is contingent upon activating the parasympathetic nervous system, regulating, co-regulating, um, as we're doing in this room and are doing constantly. Um, I, 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 you know, I don't know what the this answers or solutions are, but I can't help but wonder if they aren't somewhere. It really, it's very much deeply ingrained in our biology, our nervous systems, this altruistic, more than an impulse, uh, an imperative, and I'll leave it at that. And would love to hear your, your thoughts and comments. Thanks. I mean, given that cooperation is important in biology and important among animals and important among humans, there are many mechanisms inside our, our brain, our cognitive functions that are pointing in that. And somehow emotions 
that, re that, that reward you for behaving cooperatively, they would be seen as such mechanisms. So this is a psychological mechanism that makes sure that you behave cooperatively. Because it's tied in with your biology, because it, your well-being is actually dependent upon how you feel. Jill Bolte Taylor, one, one last thing. Jill Bolte Taylor, who wrote the wonderful book, Stroke of Insight, in, at one point she says something like, um, we like to think we are thinking beings who feel, but we are feeling beings who think. I think, again, I can't help but think that somehow that kernel uh, em may embody some of what we're talking about. But if, if I may intervene at this point, we can go back to the previous question. You know, if, if cooperation feels so good, why is it the case that we're not cooperating? So, so we have done, we have done uh, experiments also. So we not only do calculations, sometimes we do experiments. And these experiments can be done in a lab. Harvard has several labs where you can call students to come and then they, they have to solve certain tasks. But also they can be done online now and so. And uh, so we've done a bunch of experiments. And one experiment was very interesting. We asked them a typical situation of cooperation and defection. And we asked them to decide quickly. If we forced them to decide quickly, they were very cooperative. So the instinct of those people was a very cooperative one, the impulse. And then if we forced them to delay their decision and think about it carefully, we <laughs> got more defection, actually, because that particular situation was one where it kind of didn't make sense to cooperate. It was this typical game where after having done the calculation, you realize, oh, here I can actually defect. And that's so, right. that's, so the instinct was a very cooperative one. And I would argue that makes a lot of sense because we live in a world where typically the best thing that I can do is to be friendly and nice and cooperative because that's how our society works. And that's where the instincts uh, come from, are coming from. Okay, let me go to the gentleman over here, please. I'd like to suggest an answer to the bear and bird problem. <laughs> that bears evolved without refrigeration and they're not carrion eaters so when he saw the bird or she saw the bird lying there and not palatable to a bear it was rejected as not not kosher food <laughs> <laughs> okay that's interesting <laughs> All right, over there. Yes, in the back, in the back. Yeah. Thank you. Um, our little cluster over here, um, we, we were briefly talking about how, um, well, I think so far in, in this discussion right now, people have brought up sort of the problem of um, thinking about cooperation on a global scale because it's such a massive scale to comprehend. It's very hard for an individual to think in those terms when a person lives in his or her community, something more local. Um, and so, and then I can't help but think in terms of, you know, um, maybe it's because I'm not a biologist, but I can't help but think about how, you know, there are humans who suffer at, at the expense of others, you know, and how, you know, that doesn't really feel like cooperation to me, but I guess if we're thinking on an evolutionary scale, maybe this time that we're living in is one of the most cooperative that we've ever lived in, I guess. But I guess what I'm really asking is, um, given climate change and the global scale of it, um, is, is there a way where, on a, on a local um, plane, where we can sort of think globally or train ourselves to think more globally I guess, because since we, since we operate in group dynamics, um, it's really hard to think of the globe or ourselves in terms of a global group, you know? So I would just like your thoughts on that. So we have done um, two experiments, uh, and both of them are only partial. Uh, in, in, so the one on global cooperation and the one on cooperation with the future. Cooperation with the future was a paper that we published in Nature in 2014. And it started, um, I attended a conference in Cambridge in the UK, and there was the British uh, science minister, David Willits, was there uh, talking about cooperation. And he said, he gave the following anecdote. 
there was um, a company that wanted to cut down a forest to harvest the forest. And then there were some people who wanted to save the forest. And then they said they wanted to come up with all sorts of arguments to save the forest. The first argument was, don't do it, because the price of wood is not good. Later, you will get more for it or so. <laughs> they kind of didn't buy that. You know? Second argument was, don't do it, because there are all these local people who enjoy this forest, and they like to go there for a walk. It also didn't work. Third argument was, you have no right to do it, because you wouldn't even have the forest if it wasn't left to you from previous generations. Therefore, it's your obligation to leave it for the future. And I was sitting at Heathrow Airport flying back, and I wanted to know how can I turn that into a game. And so we designed the game. And we first played the game. So the game works like this. There are five people. So this is how our games are about points, you know. And so five people are sitting around a bot, and the bot has 100 units in it. And each person can harvest out of them between 0 and 20. So if every person takes 20 out, 0 is left. And so then we tell them, here's the rule. If you leave 50 inside here, we will refill it. So it can, it can grow back. And after you, there are five other people who want to continue to play. So that's the next generation. And after them, another generation. And after them, another generation. So you can choose to take out anything you like between 0 and 20, five people. But if you leave 50 in here, these other people can also continue to, and, and after them, and so there's a whole chain of generations into the future. And so we played the game first in the Harvard Business School. <laughs> and what happened? How many bots sort of were preserved for the, for the first generation? So starting at generation zero, how many bots survived? 5%. So 95% of bots were destroyed in one go. <laughs> Come to the, the divinity all, school. It'll all, be very different. All Here bots, they would be should, cherished no, for 17 all generations. Bots, all bots were gone in like three steps. <laughs> all of them. And so the typical uh, behavior was, uh, say, um, you take out eight, I take out nine, ten, uh, eleven, twenty. One person <laughs> takes out twenty, typically. <laughs> And then that destroys it. And then we interviewed the people afterwards. Why did you take out 20? And the person said, well, I realized if I don't do it, somebody else do it, and I lose. <laughs> so that was not the solution. And then a postdoc of mine suggested the following modification. And that was not, let's not have the people decide freely, but let's have voting. So we use democracy. We actually use democracy. We can all vote how much everybody shall get. And we make incentive-compatible voting in that we tell them it's the median. You will get the median. So you give five numbers, and we calculate the median, and that's given to everybody. And now all bots are sustained indefinitely. There's a huge democratic majority that would vote altruistically for the future. And that we cannot explain this why this is. This was just an observation. Game theoretically, it also doesn't make sense that they voted so altruistically, but they did vote altruistically. And uh, that has to be harnessed. So if you would have some, if you would imagine something like a vote about uh, environmental issues with sort of sustainability, it's a very big chance there's a huge democratic majority if people really understand the issues. Well, that's actually the case as far as we know right now that a large percentage of the population in the United States is very upset about climate change and believes that it's real, but it doesn't seem to work out that way with the powers that be. <laughs> okay, uh, let's go over there. Yes, in the back, yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor Nauk, for your very interesting talk. I learned a lot. Um, I'm a layman to biology and uh, I hope uh, my question would not sound too naive. I have two very simple questions. Uh, first, I know nothing, uh, I know next to nothing about evolution. The only book I read uh, most closely to your, uh, your talk today is Richard Dawkins' Selfish Gene. And it seems to me that his theory about evolution and his view on God is very different from <laughs> yours. So I'm, well, I'm wondering uh, if you think your theory is right, then his theory must be wrong. So uh, could you t 
tell us uh, how your theory is better than his explanation of uh, evolution and also his view about God? That's the first question. And the second question is, um, when Darwin uh, come up with this theory of natural selection, it gave rise to uh, the thought about uh, called social Darwinism, and it unfortunately caused very devastating result in human history, leading to lots of war or genocide or things like that. So I would like to know your view on social Darwinism and also based on your theory. I mean, or, or I didn't have a chance to uh, read your book yet, but based on your theory, can, can we develop some kind of ideas or principle or program that would help us to build a more peaceful world? Thank you. What was this? Um, the first one was um, well, uh, Dawkins. Uh, so Richard Dawkins, um, he, he wrote a number of books that are very widely read by people, especially outside the field. Uh, it's, it's sort of, uh, it's important to, to remember that he did not actually himself make any contribution to biology. So he did not discover anything. There's no, there is no such thing as Dawkins' theory of evolution. So he just, he would describe very well typically things that have accumulated over time. So it's not that in any way that I'm in competition with Dawkins' theory of evolution. There is no such thing as Dawkins' theory of evolution. There is um, uh, a controversy only about something that is called um, inclusive fitness, which is described in the selfish gene, and also Hamilton's rule, which is also described there. And those things are actually completely wrong, um, and I and others have proven that they are mathematically completely wrong. Uh, but that's almost a detail that is not really relevant in the bigger picture, other than that in our field um, there is, uh, and interestingly the controversy started in that room, here in this room, when I talked to Ed Wilson. Because um, there was this theory that was there, uh, and he was very frustrated over that theory, and thought it only existed in biology and doesn't go away because it's mathematically so elegant. And I knew that the theory was mathematically complete nonsense and thought it's only there because it's so useful for ants, which is, is his expertise. So here it was like a mutual enlightenment act in this room. And we, we wrote the paper that then together with, uh, with, with, uh, with a graduate student who disproves, I mean, who mathematically proves that this is, this is incorrect. Um, but that, um, that led to a controversy, so that's a kind of controversy in our field. But it's more a question of how do you calculate natural selection, and what is the right quantity, inclusive fitness or mm, population genetics? And what was the other question? Social Darwinism. Yes. <laughs> Also, the idea that in history, social Darwinism led to... To war, to all kinds mm -hmm. of oppression. Yeah, no, that's, I think, is a, that's a bad interpretation of evolution. And my interpretation of evolution would lead to some very different views. This is a very narrow-minded understanding of evolution that forgets about cooperation. Okay, over there, yes. Oh, okay. That's fine. Uh, I loved your talk, okay? I don't know anything. It seems to me there's, though, I mean, reason has to dominate. There's a fundamental logical error, a real logical error in what you said. Okay, what I retained was um, everything is changing. The bacteria go are going from a slower to a more... Uh, developed and then to humans and that the whole thing is changing. Therefore, and here's the, the error, I think. Therefore, because everything is changing, we must have God. That's what you said. That is what I retained. The, the fluidity, the natural um, change, points, posits its opposite, or continuum. That continuum is God. Um, this is something that makes me feel pity for many philosophers that leap. There was Heraclitus, you know. 
everything changes. There was Parmenides, nothing changes, okay? You can't go into the same river twice or you only go into the same river. So I think that you, for yourself, you seem like a wonderful guy, should look at the leap, the illogical leap from saying because everything changes, we have to posit stability. What if the planet came to the en an end, the life came to an end, where's your God? I hope it won't, but I mean, you see what I mean? There is a logical error. Change by itself without anything else at only posits change. And stability, if there is any, would posit stability. You can't go from one to the other without some real, um, it's, it's a contradiction, okay, it's illogical. And it's a contradiction that I've read all the time in philosophers. Okay, all right. I think she's talking about the un unmoving mover, the unmoved mover. Well, so the, um, basically, are you, are you rejecting every cosmological argument for the existence of God? I don't know what they are, so I couldn't reject them. Mm -hmm. But I have read, I'm just making a logical point that you cannot, in reason or in theory, go perpetual change to something stable. I think what you're trying to do, apart from proving God, is saying that psychologically conscience or something or other is continuous conscience, our, our perception, consciousness of this constant change, or that this is a human need. We would like, I would love to think that there were something stable. I'm from the Holocaust. I would love to think that there was something stable, but I don't. Okay, Re response? Um, so when I worked here with Sarah Coakley, I always thought for myself quietly that sort of I'm certain that one cannot prove the existence of God. I felt as a scientist, you know, I thought God is more like the primary axiom, everything can follow from God, but you cannot deduce God from scientific principles. And then over the years, I read more and more the cosmological arguments of, um, of, of Aquinas, and then also the proof of Avicenna, which is actually preceding those, and which I find particularly elegant. And so I'm no, long, I'm no longer sure uh, how to think about the cosmological arguments. And personally, I find them extremely convincing, but I do not see them, they don't seem to be the same as deductive mathematical proofs. They are more like contemplations about the existence of God. Um, but I, 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 it's, uh, it's, uh, it seems to me that they are almost like proofs, but but I don't know exactly how to, to compare them. So if you prove something mathematically and then both people who accept the rules of the game, they agree then. And then if you read these cosmological arguments, if, if people accept that, they might agree to some extent, but it would always, you always have the feeling there's a gap. Okay, yes, sir. I appreciate your talk. I'm in a I'm interested in how an understanding of God might support your proposition and your understanding. If you start with Buber who says that in the beginning was the relation, and you understand God as a relational being, and you understand that relational being is one of love, God is love, and then you go to the, then you believe that that image is implanted in everyone, that DNA is in everyone, does that, make a difference, or is that helpful in your de developing this understanding of cooperation? I think it's very helpful to read in various religious traditions, for example, in the Bhagavad Gita, that you would also read, you should see yourself in every other creature. You, you should see God in every creature. The Atman is the Brahman, or so. I think that's very helpful for human flourishing. And I would even go so far as to say it is needed for human flourishing. That without it, we are kind of not on the right trajectory. 
Okay, a couple more questions and then we're gonna to come to a close uh, over here. Or, okay, you can go first, but then you'll, you'll be next, yeah. Uh, th thank you very much for the talk. And I can understand your concept of God in the mathematical um, permanence sense. But what about the tension between science and religion? Does, it, does your concept incorporate an interventionist God, God to whom people could appeal? And just, because uh, you gave, had that beautiful poetry at an end, let me just give you a quote from Kayam. And that inverted bowl we call the sky, where under crawling cooped we live and die, lift not your hands to it for help for it rolls impotently on as thou or I. As, as thou or I. So in some sense, I feel, and I do not, I, personally, I do not really think of an interventional God in some sense. There is this idea in biology which is called intelligent design, and they, um, they, they, would, they would point out, here is a certain scientific circumstance, here is a certain property, and um, evolution cannot give rise to it, they would say. So there is something that cannot have emerged by evolution, um, and therefore uh, we would need to evoke the action of God. Mm, the interesting thing is, um, somebody who made a similar argument, it was actually Newton himself, because Newton was so, uh, uh, he understood his thing so deeply that he realized once he had the equations of gravity, the solar system is not stable. So the planets are actually not on stable orbits. Uh, and therefore he thought that's actually a proof for the existence of God because God has to be there to readjust the planets all the time to keep them stable. And um, Leibniz then remarked to that, if that's your worldview, then if, why didn't God get it right in the first place? Yeah. <laughs> it's a big, that, that's so, a big theological problem. Yeah. So I... I <laughs> ward off a sickness or cure, no, I think cure I'm, I'm, a blind person. I think that makes a lot of sense for people. You have to keep in mind that God is outside of time and is somehow seeing the whole trajectory and is kind of has lifted this whole trajectory into existence. So the trajectory already contained the prayer that is now offered by people. I'd like to just point out that this particular theology, uh, Anne Moniz could speak, is, is very well known in various Hindu schools of theology. So this, this argument, uh, she, you're looking at me as though you don't know what I'm talking Not about. Quite, no. but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's another topic. <laughs> yeah. But uh, so these are, we're getting into some fundamental theological issues. And the Buddhists actually reject uh, the notion of a god on the very grounds that this lady in the front was, was raising. But so this is, these, these are long arguments that have been in place for a long time. Yes. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I'm confused about the relationship between competition and cooperation. In your presentation, I feel that there's a presumption that competition is bad and cooperation is good. And this, apart from the traditional evolutionary theory that I have to survive in order so that you have to be sacrificed. But you present another perspective that we need to cooperate. But there is another part of sentence that people cooperate in order to better compete, mm -hmm. compete, or in order to compete better in the future. So I see the inseparable relation between competition and cooperation. They never separate from each other, and people can never, I mean, can never take oh this to a pure cooperation without any competition. But Professor Jasso. Um, gives us an example that cooperation could be also expanding. It is not be limited within the group that we that we cooperate in order to um, compete other compete other people, but it is expanding. A bear can save a bird. Um, I mean, for that example, I don't know. Uh, when I hear this story. I don't want to figure out what that beer thinks about, oh, it, this bird is my child, or this bird is my friend, or something like But I wonder, I wonder what this story wants to tell me. I wonder what I, I can learn from this story. There are so many sad stories like 
a bear eats his child. But there's also a good story that bear saves a bird. I don't know. Does no, that make what, sense? What, you said, <laughs> what you said in the beginning is yeah. completely that's correct. Funny. Yeah, and, that's, that's okay. and completely uh, the right view and very well expressed. Uh, competition and cooperation are totally linked to each other. And so we have mutation, and then we have selection, and then we have cooperation. So the hierarchy is really mutation generates variation, then we have natural selection, and then you get cooperation. There's always natural selection, but sometimes natural selection leads just to defection, sometimes it leads to cooperation. And the amazing thing is that there's also cooperation. So the important thing to keep in mind is that there's also cooperation, and cooperation gives rise to biological complexity. OK. We're doing well, but I think probably one more question over there. Yes. The dean also the has dean. a question. Oh, oh, oh the dean. Oh, yes. Well, let this uh, <laughs> lady there, and then the dean can <laughs> ask the final question. Thank you. Um, I wanted to go back to the concept of super cooperation. And I was thinking in terms of um, energy that, that's taken to do cooperation versus competition. So if I were to go from here to, to the chair, I can do a, a direct line, which is the least resist, path of resistance, and it takes the least amount of energy. Or I can do a circuitous route, which would take a lot more energy. Now, um, thinking about cooperation, in terms of energy, um, from a physics point of view, it seems like the world, every, every process, you know, all the processes that we can think of on, in the world, in the universe, is tending towards that low energy, um, you know, what would take the lowest energy to accomplish something. And from that point of view, if you are coming from that point of view, then cooperation is the best way to achieve something moving forward. And I wanted to, uh, I wanted to tie that with the climate, um, and also two things. I wanted to tie that with that experiment that you did where a group of people, when they were asked about a question and to make a decision quickly, they made a, a decision where um, it took, I mean, they, were, they, were, they didn't have much time to, do, to make that decision. They went to the route of what, what makes the, the least what is the least energy of resistance way of going about it? Yeah. Uh, the other thing was uh, about climate change. It feels like there's so much inertia against doing something about it on an individual basis. You really have to cooperate to move that mountain, to move, to make an action about, to take an action and make something um, that would allow for that mountain to be moved. So cooperation actually is beneficial in that, from that point of view. So just, I wanted to just hear your thoughts about these three points. Mm -hmm. So we, if we like, um, in mathematical biology, you always look to physics as a guidance. You know, mathematical principles in physics are unbelievably elegant, and we always look whether similar principles can be seen in biology. And sometimes they can, and sometimes they cannot, and we don't really understand why. But um, so there's no mathematical theory yet that would describe cooperation as something like a, a path that minimizes resistance or minimizes time, like the path of light, for example. But that would be interesting. Uh, so I don't know that. Uh, the other things, again, because climate change is mentioned, uh, I also uh, had a collaboration, and recently there was a performance in Farkas Hall where we tried to put together an artistic performance together with a scientific performance. And that's another way how we try to get people motivated to think about cooperation with the future. And so the idea would be that it's not only scientific presentations, not only scientific discussions, but a mixture of scientific uh, together with artistic performances in order to appeal to the emotions of people. Okay, uh, Dean Hampton. Um, uh, thanks very much, um, Professor Gatso. Um, so you, you, you mentioned that um, the, the, th the three winning strategies of cooperation are uh, hopefulness, uh, generosity, and, and forgiveness. Um, 
And, and it, so in the spirit of this colloquium of religions and the practice of peace, um, if these are, are indeed, um, you know, deep within um, the mathematics and the physics of uh, our being, is there a way of um, culturally mobilizing those, or how would we think about those in terms of uh, having an intervention in, in the field of religion, conflict, and peace building? Uh, do they have a particular salience in that uh, as we think uh, outwards into that? Um, and, and if so, how would we uh, leverage that mm -hmm. in, in a culturally significant way? I mean, it would be interesting to present these ideas uh, to decision makers. So we could um, we could have. Uh, that's also something which we we are discussing somehow. Decision makers before an important meeting, that they engage in a, in an experimental game-like situation of cooperation and defection. <coughs> if they would be willing to do this. Uh, if they would be willing to, to see a performance that we have on, on cooperation with the future. There are actually people who try to take the cooperation with the future performance to the United Nations and show them in the General Assembly before they take a vote. And some people have tried, they are working on this and whether it has an effect, whether it will ever happen. But I think education is important, and the role that this initiative plays is, is very important. I think we have to also get these ideas to the Harvard students in a, in a, in a much larger way. And uh, something like this, I think we discussed this, should be part of the core uh, for Harvard students, actually. I think, as, is, if I understand it correctly, Harvard students so far have no chance to hear a core lecture uh, about uh, religious ideas. Is that true? Sorry? Is that part of the core? The core? There's no religion in the core curriculum? Well, in the gen ed curriculum, there's, there's a lot of religion, so. Uh, it's not required. It's yeah. Possible, so I the students aren't required to take it. That's true. That's true. Well, we, we certainly would be in favor of that last <laughs> suggestion. Uh, so uh, Liz Lee Hood, who is the organizer of this event, has her hand up, and I can't turn her down, so because she's paying my salary for this. I also know I have one minute, there's one minute on the clock, so it's just a follow-on question, which is, um, given that there is such a great need for cooperation for so many reasons, and given that you've helped to identify dynamics of cooperation and successful cooperation as well as virtues for cooperation, if you could affect the curriculum at universities such as Harvard, because clearly universities have a pivotal role because they're developing the decision makers who will go on to make decisions in many contexts, what would you recommend, what would that look like if you could shape the curricula, if you could, um, what would you recommend be added and be done as part of university learning? Thank you. <laughs> I think that what I, what I would wish most is actually that a, a respectful way to talk about God with students. That's what I would wish most. Because that, um, for, I mean, for me, uh, Harvard is and many other, many other universities, they are too secular. They have sort of completely lost this other resource, which I think is a, is a human treasure and it's extremely valuable. And that um, is very unfortunate. So once I was actually invited by Harvard students to give a talk about such ideas in the science center. And I thought, <laughs> am I allowed in the science center to talk about God? You know, who are these people? And they were, that was a club of like maybe 150, 200, very devout Christian students, and because of students, they could organize this. Um, I find, I think that the university should offer more possibilities to talk, where the students can listen to respectful views of religious and philosophical ideas. Well, once again, may I commend you to Harvard Divinity School. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thank you, everybody. Uh, and let us thank our wonderful speaker who fielded really a very wide range of questions.
it's his own fault because he brought up so many topics that he that then that then inspired such a huge range of questions. But thank you for raising some really fundamental and really really important questions. Uh, according to we we have a few more events be, before or, or moments before everybody leaves the room. Uh, first of all, we are going to have a, an announcement from Dean Hampton. Yeah, just a, a, a few very brief things. Um, uh, first of all, I'd obviously just like to thank uh, 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 Professor uh, Nowak again for a, a wonderful uh, presentation. Also, our two, um, you know, our moderator and discussant. Um, I, I thought this was a tremendous evening of uh, fun and intellectual stimulation and and important. So thank you so much to all of you. I really appreciate uh, your contribution. Um, just a few very uh, brief things. If you have ideas or concerns you were not able to raise at this session, and it was a lively session of questions and discussion, but if you, if you had a, a concern that you didn't feel able to articulate, uh, please do uh, 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 write it down and put it in the basket, and we will pay attention to it. Um, in January, we will be offering three intensive skill building workshops on dignity, dialogue, and restorative justice, given by really terrific people. Um, the application period has already passed, so tough. No, um, but if you're interested in applying for the dialogue or dignity workshops, please contact RPP in case there might still be space. So um, uh, if those are of interest to you, please get in touch with us. In the spring, we'll be continuing our Sustainable Peace Cafes, the first of which will be on Thursday, February 21st, and they're designed and led by a very talented student team. Um, and we hope that you will join us. Uh, if you haven't yet done so, be sure to join the RPP mailing list so that you can be brought uh, uh, up to date on what we're doing. Um, uh, so uh, but finally, uh, welcome you all to join us for a reception with tea and refreshments and goodies in the lobby. And we will have books by Professor uh, Nowak on sale. Um, so this is your chance to become even better informed. Um, so we wish you all an enjoyable and peaceful winter break. Happy holidays to everyone who will be celebrating. Um, and we, our very last thing is an act of hopefulness and generosity and, um, um, uh, and maybe even love. Um, uh, we have a, a, a gift for our... Um, this is for uh, you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And these are for our... Thank you, oh, thank you so much. Sure, thank you. Do you want to leave the moment of silence? Yeah, why don't we do that? Uh, it's actually a new theorem. So, um, 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 so let, let, let's just spend um, um, maybe just 15 seconds of j just quiet reflection on, on, uh, on uh, things that have um, been important to us tonight before we leave. So. Thank you very much. <clears throat> <laughs> 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 <laughs>